So uh, last time we started talking about uh, LiDAR. And um, as usual, it's, uh, we're going to follow the same theme as, as, as the other chapters, which is uh, basically uh, we start from the physics. And when it comes to the physics, um, the, the principle of operation of LiDAR is shown in this picture, which is the exact same as other two sensors that we talked in the previous chapters, which is radar and, and sonar. So you have some source, and the source sends out some waveforms uh, to the environment. The waveforms hit some targets. Part of the energy echoes back. And then uh, the receiver part of the sensor captures some of that echo uh, energy and uh, converts that to electrical signals. And then we process the signals to basically do, do sensing. Now, specifically for the case of uh, LiDAR, um, um, when it comes to basically this, this principle, the source that is used for LiDAR is, is a laser source. right? And then uh, there's always some optics. And by optics, we mean some uh, uh, lens components or lens assembly uh, that, that helps basically uh, kind of like shape the, 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 the beam uh, uh, pattern uh, to something that is useful for, for, for LiDAR. And uh, so, so that's basically the, the, the TX optics that we have. And then you get a, usually a very collimated beam that, that goes through the environment. Uh, so that's the, 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 the transmitter laser beam. And it hits the target. And again, part of that energy echoes back. And then on the receive side, we again have uh, some optics, meaning uh, one or a few lenses, that helps capture this uh, uh, basically echoed uh, light. And uh, that uh, echoed light is being shined on a photodetector. And what the photodetector does is it basically converts photons to electrons for you. So the input is light, right? Light goes in, and some current comes out, electrical current comes out. And we'll talk in, in, in great detail about the physics of photodetectors. But out of here, you basically now are back in the elect from optical domain to the electrical domain. And uh, you can do the usual thing, basically pass this through a DSP to convert it to digital. Uh, I'm sorry, pass it through an ADC uh, to convert it to a digital signal. And then you can do your digital signal processing on it to basically detect what you're interested in. Um, so again, the principle is the same time of flight, right? So you measure, or the sensor measures the round trip time of flight tau. And uh, the range, for instance, is calculated by multiplying uh, tau over 2 by the speed of light c. Um, and uh, also, for the case of LIDAR, um, as, as we'll see, most LIDARs, not all of them, but most of them work with these like very highly collimated pencil-like beams. Um, so uh, basically, you can safely assume that that beam only hits at most one target in the scene. So all the echo signal that you receive back, you can always make the assumption that it's from just one target. Uh, and uh, that will, A, makes your DSP a lot easier because, for instance, in radar, because the radiation patterns are typically very wide, we could not make that assumption. Um, there's almost always multiple multiple uh, targets echoing back for radar. Uh, but, but also, it makes the direction of arrival estimation almost trivial for LIDAR because basically the DOA is the angle you were pointing at. So this angle theta here, uh, which you usually scan. So there's some scanning mechanism uh, that, that, that uh, basically uh, does like a raster scan of the beam, as we'll see. So you just basically read back where was I pointing to, what was the angle I was pointing to, and that is your, your DOA. So there's essentially, most of the time, almost no signal processing required when it comes to DOA estimation in LiDAR. So again, you should expect much less or much lighter DSP in the case of LiDAR, as, 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 as we'll see. Uh, but uh, so the equivalent of basically this part in the case of the radar was just an antenna, right? In radar, we had antennas that would radiate out a, a electromagnetic uh, 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 beam for us. And also on the receive side, in the case of radar, we also had antennas. So uh, remember, antennas could, could operate as both transmitters and, and receivers of, of electromagnetic waves. But the uh, same was true for sonar. So these sonar transducers mo mostly 
uh, can operate bidirectionally, both as a transmitter and a receiver. But for uh, LiDAR, it's not the same. Um, so a laser source cannot act as a receiver, and also a photo detector cannot act as a transmitter. So you need completely separate devices to do transmit and receive in, in optics. That's important. Is the principle of operation clear? OK, so we're going to do the usual thing. Start from the physics. We'll talk about lasers. We'll talk about lenses or optics. We'll talk about these collimated laser beams. We'll talk about how you know the scanning works. And uh, we'll also talk in detail about photo detection principles and devices that are used. And at that point, we can complete you know, a system level description of what a LiDAR should be, like a block diagram-like thing that you have seen in other cases. And then we talk about waveforms and signal processing. OK. So uh, let's get going. So what is, what is a laser beam? So uh, it's, it's actually not different from um, RF uh, waves. So it is also electromagnetic radiation. Um, so all the physics of, of, of electromagnetic waves that we talked about uh, for radar also apply to LIDAR, like uh, they're governed by Maxwell's equations and things like that. The main difference is frequency or, or wavelength, which, which are related as, as we know. So frequency is just uh, speed of light over wavelength. So at, at, at LIDAR, uh, we operate at much, much, much higher frequencies compared to radar. So radar, remember, it was like at tens of gigahertz, right? 24 gigahertz, 77 gigahertz. Uh, LIDAR typically operates at infrared frequencies, which are hundreds of terahertz. So you are like four or five orders of magnitude higher in frequency, which means much smaller wavelengths uh, that, that, that we're working. So that's basically the main difference. But it's the same physics, essentially. Again, it's electromagnetic radiation at a different frequency. But what happens, which is interesting, is at these higher frequencies or shorter wavelengths, um, um, basically uh, you can use, again, things like lenses to make really, really narrow beams. Um, so that was a challenge for radar, right? So for radar to make highly directional antennas, uh, you need these very big dishes, basically, like parabolic antennas or very, very large uh, uh, MIMO arrays to, to make like pencil-like beams, uh, as we saw. And, and that's not uh, practical for uh, robotics. Uh, in other applications in radar, they can use those antennas. But in robotics, you have to you know, work with small apertures, which means radiation patterns are very wide. Not the case for. Uh, LIDAR. At these frequencies, you can easily, you know, super uh, laser focus basically your beam. Um, and again, that, that this makes the DOA estimation almost trivial in, in, in LIDAR. But again, remember that it's the same physics. So you have a magnetic field H, you have an electric field E, they're orthogonal, and then they travel in, in some, some direction. Uh, that is the direction of the propagation of the beam. Also exactly like uh, the case of uh, 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 radio frequency waves, uh, at, at optical frequencies, uh, you also get attenuation as, as you go through air. If, you, if you're going through perfect vacuum, it wouldn't attenuate. But as soon as you have some material in the way, even if it's just air, uh, you start uh, seeing attenuation. Now, when it comes to attenuation, it's uh, highly frequency dependent or, or wavelength dependent uh, at, 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 optical at optical wavelengths. So here, let's look at the, this, this plot down here. So this shows uh, atmospheric transmission, not absorption. So it's kind of like the inverse of, of, of absorption that, that uh, we are looking at here. So it's a number between 0 and 1. 0 means nothing goes through. Every, all of it is getting absorbed. Uh, one is perfect transparency, basically. Now, uh, x-axis is optical wavelength in microns. Um, so for instance, visible light, as you might know, it's between like 0.4 to about uh, 0.7 microns. So this, this uh, band basically, um, this here, this would be our, our visible light. And you know, there's, I mean, it's, it's, it's air is most, mostly transparent, not perfectly transparent, but mostly transparent as those frequencies. And I mean, as, as we know, that's, that's, that's why we can see at those, those frequencies. Uh, now, uh, when it comes to choices of what wavelengths to use for LIDARs, well, first of all, you, don't, you, you do not want to be at visible wavelengths, because then, I mean, it's, it becomes just an annoyance, you know. Uh, you start like shining laser pointers at, 
every direction, that's, that's uh, not very practical. So you want to be you know, uh, outside the visible uh, band, and uh, then, then you get to basically infrared frequency. So um, frequencies here are IR, basically. And it's usually divided into like near IR, mid IR, far, far IR. But uh, most of uh, the frequencies used for uh, 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 LIDARs are, are, are near infrared, basically. Specifically, there are three frequencies that are uh, commonly used. So there's 850 nanometers, or three uh, wavelengths. You can convert them to frequencies if you want. 850 nanometers, 905, and 1550. Now, you might ask why these very specific frequencies, and it's uh, for two reasons. One is, of course, you want uh, very high transmission, right? Otherwise, uh, you, it just uh, uh, eats into your, 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 your SNR, basically. It, it, it attenuates too much as it propagates. And as you see, all these three frequencies, the atmospheric transmission is very high. It's actually pretty close to almost one. So that's a good thing. Uh, but there are other good frequencies, right, like, uh, or, or wavelengths. It could be like here or here or here and so on. So the other thing that uh, makes these uh, uh, three choices very attractive is uh, uh, basically the, the devices, and by devices I mean laser diodes and, and uh, uh, photo detectors that uh, you can manufacture which are cheap and, and uh, um, efficient. And it turns out that at those specific frequencies, um, you can fabricate uh, very efficient, very cheap devices. And that's the other reason why these specific frequencies are, uh, are very attractive. Now, um, 850 nanometer uh, is, is kind of being uh, phased out um, because uh, from a performance point of view, 905 and, and 1550 nanometer are, are better frequencies. So earlier LIDARs like 10, 15 years ago used uh, 850 a lot, but these days they're mostly at, at nine, uh, 905 and, and 1550, okay? So um, uh, is there a better choice? Like if you were to choose between 905 and 1550, um, is there, uh, like how, how do you compare the two? It turns out that there's lots of trade-offs when it comes to the choice of wavelength or frequency for, for, for LiDAR. So specifically, 905, um, it's, it's the most common today, mostly used in direct, uh, direct detection LiDAR. We'll talk about the details of direct detection, but it's, it's a type of LiDAR. Um, and uh, what's good about 905 is that components are cheaper, like lasers, photo detectors, the, the basically they can, they can be manufactured more cheaply. And also water absorption is lower at, at 905. And why do we care about water absorption? Because it means that if you have high water content in the atmosphere, like if you want to see through fog or see through rain, um, 905 could help you a little bit because it's absorbed less by water. What's not good about it is that uh, uh, you get high uh, solar radiation at that wavelength. So a lot of sunlight has you know, energy in, in, in 905, which basically becomes interference for your LIDAR. Um, your, uh, this, the, the responsivity of your photo detectors are a little uh, uh, lower at 905 compared to 1550. And also, there's, a, 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 there's regulations on how much optical power you can safely uh, transmit such that it's safe for the human eye. Um, and that's called the maximum permissible exposure uh, limit or the MPE limit. And uh, that limit depends on the wavelength or uh, the frequency. We also have that for uh, RF frequencies, by the way. Um, so we talked about it uh, briefly when, when we were discussing radar. Uh, now at optical uh, wavelengths, uh, it turns out that the MPE level is, is lower at 905 compared to 1550, which means you can transmit less power, uh, which is not desirable because that means lower SNR. Uh, what about 1550? Uh, so that is uh, mostly used in coherent LIDAR. Again, we'll talk about what coherent LIDAR is, but it's the you know, second main type of LIDAR. Um, uh, MPE limits, as I said, are, are higher, so you can transmit more power. That's a desirable thing. Uh, you get uh, less interference from solar radiation. Again, that's a good thing. Uh, you get higher photo detector responsivity and efficiency. That's also a good thing. What's not good about 1550, uh, components are expensive. But note that this is a thing that uh, 
when it comes to, for instance, uh, uh, semiconductor devices, they always get cheaper over time. So yes, today, 1550 devices are more expensive than 905. In five or 10 years, they might be the same price. So always you get, you know, uh, this uh, basically devices become cheaper as, as the, the manufacturing processes become more mature, basically. Uh, and the other thing that's not good, well, this is physics. This one is, again, absorption in, in water. So as you see here, there's pros and cons. And at the end of the day, um, you should decide based on, the, based on the requirements of the application what is a better choice. Today, uh, like what's the commercial LIDARs out there, most of them, and by most I mean about maybe like 90, 95% of them are using 905. But 1550 is, is getting traction pretty rapidly. Um, um, here's a, a, a more you know, um, a quantitative comparison showing these trade-offs we just talked about. So here you have four plots, and each shows one of the trade-offs between 1550 and uh, 905. Um, so uh, just one thing to note, I noticed this morning that in all four plots, the x-axis units are wrong. It says microns, but it's actually nanometers. So you should correct that, and it applies to all four. So x is, again, wavelength in nanometers, and this uh, top left one shows the, the basically the, the so solar irradiance. So uh, basically, this is the spectrum of the, 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 the sunlight that you get as a function of wavelength. And it has uh, this interesting curve, but the point is that, again, at 905, you get more solar radiation than uh, 1550. So on this metric, 1550, again, is, is desirable because this means less interference from the sun. Now, this uh, second plot, um, bottom left, shows, again, this is nanometers, uh, shows the responsivity of photodetectors. And what responsivity is, is how much current you get out of the uh, photodetector in amps per one watt of optical power that's incident on it. Uh, so that's the, the responsivity. Your units is amps per watt. And um, there's, there's two things to note here. One is you need different devices or different types of materials at different wavelengths. For instance, at 905, silicon devices are best. That give, those give you the best uh, responsivity, about 0.6. But if you go to 1550, silicon doesn't even work. So you need more exotic materials, uh, for instance, indium gallium arsenide or NGAS, uh, that, that can operate very efficiently at about like 0.9 or so, 0.9 to 1 amps per watt of responsivity. And this also, uh, so, so on the responsivity metric, yes, it's better to operate at 1550, but because you need more exotic materials, that's why it's more expensive. So on the, on the cost metric, it's, it's not desirable. Again, this could change, right? I mean, these processes become more mature and cheaper over time. Uh, third plot is water absorption. Um, again, as a, a, a function of wavelength in, in, in nanometers. And uh, uh, again, you compare the two, and at 905, your uh, water absorption is 0 0.075 per centimeter. And at 1550, it's 10.8 per centimeter. So there is more than a factor of 100 difference between the two. OK? Um, but practically, it's not as big of an issue as you might think, because the water content in, in the atmosphere is typically very low, except in very severe conditions like dense fog or rain or things like that. So in normal operating conditions, and by normal I mean like, I don't know, California conditions, it's fine. You don't, you don't care much. Um, that came out wrong. I don't mean California. Everywhere else is abnormal compared to California, just for the record. But uh, you know what I mean. Um, but, uh, but again, if, if you go to a, a place at, with high humidity or uh, fog or, or dense fog or rain, this, this, this number can, can, can really, really degrade uh, the performance at, at 1550. Yeah? So far, all of our autonomous cars like in San Francisco, like uh -huh. it's really foggy there. So yes. like, what do they not use LiDAR? Uh, well, they, they use LiDAR, but it becomes very limited. Actually, there is. Um, uh, I'll try to remember, there's, a, uh, uh, there's two interesting blog posts from two of the companies that operate at, uh, in San Francisco. One is from Waymo, and I think Cruise also has an interesting 
uh, blog posts, and they actually show how much it degrades in, in fog and rain. Uh, and they show some point clouds from the lidars, and you get a ton of false positives very close to the to the to the lidar. It it can still kind of sort of work, and I'll show also some examples hopefully later today. Uh, but uh, in in algorithms, they need to you know detect that oh this is this is a rainy condition. My lidar false positives are very high, and then they rely more on other sensors like radar. In, 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 in those cases, yes. Um, finally, the, the last uh, comparison is uh, this maximum permissible emissions. Again, this is uh, such that uh, these limits are determined by regulatory bodies to ensure uh, we don't uh, hurt human eyes um, by, 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 by too high of an exposure. So there's multiple curves here, and each curve, so this assumes you're sending pulses of finite duration. So each, each curve is a pulse duration. So this is like a quarter second uh, duration, and so a longish pulse, and this is a very short pulse of just 100 femtoseconds. And then the x-axis is energy density, not power, right? So that's because it's energy, that means a longer pulse, you can send more energy because you spread it over a longer time and, and it's lower power. It's, it's a bit of a weird plot to me. I would rather just plot uh, power density and just have one curve instead of multiple energy curves for different pulse durations. But for some reason, that's the standard way of, of you know, how it's shown in, in, the, in the official documentation. The point is, um, so you can pick one of the pulse durations, let's say 0.25, and again, the MPE limit at uh, 9.05, it's much lower than the MPE limit as at 15.50. And here means 15.50 is more desirable on this metric because you can, you can send more power, basically. So again, this is just to illustrate that when it comes to the choice of wavelength, there's multiple trade-offs. So it's not an easy, you know, choice of, oh, this is better than that. It really depends on a bunch of things, and that's why both are, are being used uh, in, in practice. Any questions? Okay, let's continue. So now we're going to start talking about uh, laser physics. Now, uh, at this part, uh, just uh, uh, full disclosure, uh, we're not going to go as deep as we usually go into the physics. Uh, because in this case, to really you know get to the the bottom of the physics, it's really beyond the scope of this course. Like you need to have taken a couple of graduate courses in quantum mechanics, for instance, to really you know get to the bottom. So so this part is going to be light, uh, but still we're going to talk about useful stuff. Okay. So what is a laser? A laser is a device that generates a beam of coherent monochromatic light. And uh, what does it mean? Monochromatic means single frequency. So that means pretty much uh, all of the energy is contained within a very you know, uh, a narrow uh, uh, frequency band, if you look at the power spectrum of the light that's coming out of the device. And by coherent, we mean that basically all the photons that are coming out of the device are uh, at, at the same, well, of course, they're at the same wavelength, but they're also traveling in the same direction. They have the same polarization. They have the same uh, direction of travel, and, and, and so on and so forth. So essentially, a perfectly coherent light source, if you inspect that individual photons coming out of it, you can't even distinguish them. That's perfect coherency. They're all the same in every um, metric, basically. Frequency, phase, direction, polarization, and all that. Um, and then the process, the physical process that enables um, a, a laser source, it's called stimulated emission of photons. And, and we'll talk a little more about what stimulated emission is. But in order to uh, uh, basically have this process of the stimulated emission, or in order to uh, um, build a laser, you need essentially three components. Uh, one is a cavity. Uh, a cavity, you can, you can think of it as, you know, as an empty space that can contain light, and uh, at the two ends of it, you have mirrors. So light would just, you know, bounce back and forth between the two mirrors and be contained uh, 
uh, within that cavity. So that's what the cavity is. Then you need an optical gain medium. What a gain medium is, is it's a special material. It can be a solid, as we'll see, or a gas or other types of materials. But what it does is uh, it can uh, absorb energy and then it can convert that absorbed energy into photons, uh, which then become the laser uh, light. And that's what a gain medium is. And finally, you need a source. It can be electrical source, optical source, or a heat source to basically couple energy or feed energy into this gain medium. And that source is called the pump. So you need to pump up energy to the, to the gain medium. And the gain medium is contained inside the cavity. And then, by some magic, it, the lasing starts to happen. Uh, here's a picture uh, showing what, what a um, laser could look like in, in, in practice. So as I said, it, you have a cavity, and a cavity is just some empty space, uh, typically enclosed between two mirrors. So you have one mirror at, at, at each end. And the two mirrors, one of them is a fully re reflective mirror. So 100% of the light basically gets reflected back from this mirror. But the other end is a partially reflective mirror. Uh, why partially reflective mirror? Because if both ends are fully reflective, well, there's no laser coming out. You need some of the light to escape the cavity so you can use it for, in practice. So, so, so the, the actual laser beam comes out of the partially reflective side of the, of the cavity. Inside the cavity, as I said, you have some optical gain medium. We'll talk more about this. And then you have some mechanism to basically couple or pump energy into your gain, uh, gain medium. And then at the output, if you inspect this laser output, uh, like if you look at the uh, power versus frequency, for instance, a power spectrum, you would see something like this, which as expected, it's monochromatic. Most of the energy is just at a single wavelength or a single frequency. So this one is pretty close, not exactly, but very close to 15, 15 nanometers. And uh, again, y-axis is power in dB, and, and it's a log scale. So you see, like, this, this is a very large number, right, uh, 48, 48 dB. So everything is pretty much noise and almost all the energy is at just that one frequency and that's very characteristic of a laser compared to like if you have something that is uh, not coherent like a, an LED or a light bulb and then you look at the power spectrum of, of, of those light sources you would see very broad and it's so broad that I can't probably even like show it on this scale of wavelength but it's much 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 broader than this because you it, it, it uh, basically emits uh, light at, at many different wavelengths. Um, so that's the, the main difference between a laser and a non-coherent light source. Uh, questions? OK, so let's talk a little more about this stimulated emission and see what it is. And again, this is that specifically that case where we can't go into the, the real, like the depth of the physics as I usually like to. Uh, it's going to be a little cartoonish. Uh, but it's still useful, I think, to talk about it. So stimulated emission is a three-step process. Um, what happens is that first, um, as uh, you uh, pump energy into your gain medium, as you couple energy into it, and again, the coupling mechanism can be optical, so it can shine light on the gain medium, or it can be electrical, you pass some electrical current through the uh, gain medium. Some of the atoms within the gain medium absorb uh, the pump energy uh, from, again, if it's optical, they absorb energy from the photons. If it's electrical, they, uh, they can uh, uh, absorb heat, for instance. And uh, they go into, by absorbing that energy, uh, they go into the, an excited state, uh, those atoms, or some of the electrons in, 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 in those atoms go to an excited state, uh, which is just a higher energy level. And then if you wait some time, some of those excited electrons will just randomly return to their baseline or ground state. And when they return to the ground state, they release the energy that they had originally absorbed from the pump in optical form. So they release that excess energy into photons. And that process, that random process of some of those excited atoms or electrons come back and release energy, that's, that is called spontaneous emission. It just happens spontaneously. Uh, 
Um, the, still, there's no lasing. This is, this is still, there's no coherence. There's, there's some random photons basically getting released in the, in the optical gain medium. But then the magic happens, which is the stimulated emission. So as these spontaneously emitted photons are traveling within the cavity, they interact with some of the other excited atoms, and then they cause them to return to the ground state and release more photons, okay? Uh, so they stimulate more emission, basically. That's why it's called stimulated emission. But, but the really magical thing about the stimulated emission is that uh, photons that are released by this process, from the process of a stimulated emission, they perfectly match the photons that uh, basically originally caused that, that, that emission. So they, they would be released in, at the same frequency, have the same phase, have the same direction, and have the same polarization. So that's full coherence. Okay, uh, here's, a, here's a picture uh, basically showing this three-step process. Again, uh, what, what we are showing here, it's kind of like a, a, a cartoon of the gain medium. And uh, the y-axis here is, shows the energy level. So before anything has happened, uh, if, if you look at like any, any uh, atom inside the gain medium, uh, it has a number of electrons. And they're at the ground state. We call that the, 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 the valence band. And then uh, there is the conduction band, which is empty. So none of the electrons is at an excited state yet. Then you pump it, so you couple some energy. And there is some energy difference between the, the, the ground state and the excited state. Call that delta E. So, so that's the energy of the conduction band minus energy of the, of the valence band. And uh, it's, it's equal to. Um, or let's, let's talk about what HF is in the next step. So as you pump it, some of these electrons absorb the pump energy and go to an excited state. So now, now you have a number of excited electrons. And then spontaneous emission happens. This is a completely random process. Some of these electrons randomly uh, go back to, to their ground state. And as they go back, they have to release that extra energy that delta E needs to get released, right? in the form of a photon. And that photon, what frequency is it at, right? Or what wavelength is it at? Uh, again, in, in quantum mechanics, it can be shown that the energy of the photon is equal to uh, basically delta E divided by H, or delta E is equal to H, which is Planck's constant. Times the frequency. So essentially, this delta E determines the frequency of the photons that, that are going to get released. So this is, this is a random process. But as this uh, spontaneously emitted photon is traveling across the cavity, it's going to interact with more atoms and cause or stimulate them to emit more photons. So now you get two photons, for instance, by this process of the stimulated emission. And those photons are going to be perfectly coherent. Again, they're going to be at the same frequency, same phase. They will travel at the same direction. And they will have the same polarization. So that's, that's essentially a stimulated emission. So this is what makes a laser. And this is the spontaneous emission is what, what makes any light source that not a laser, like incandescent light, LEDs, and whatnot, those are all only doing a spontaneous emission. Uh, fun fact is that, again, it, it, this is just cartoons we are showing here. But if you want to actually study the physics of it, it turns out that the physics of a stimulated emission at the quantum mechanics level, um, it's, it's far more straightforward than spontaneous emission. So like if you take courses in quantum mechanics, after a couple of weeks, you would know how a laser works. But it might take you a year to know how an incandescent light works at the, at the physics level. It's far more complicated to explain it. But um, this is, for us, I think this is, this is the level we leave it at. Here's another picture. Again, same process, but um, showing it in a different way. So here, again, uh, we, have a, we have a cavity. So you have the two mirrors, full, fully reflective mirror and a partial reflective mirror. We're pumping it. Um, electrically, optically, somehow coupling energy to it. And then in the middle, you have the gain medium. And this blue circles are, say, the atoms in the, in the uh, gain medium. Uh, so, so you start with everything at the ground state. As you pump energy, some of these atoms absorb the, the pump energy. And they go into the excited state. So those are colored in purple. So the purple are excited atoms. And at some point, you get you know, 
uh, more atoms in the excited state than ground state. So that's called population inversion. And then this random uh, process of the spontaneous emission happens. So that's a step three, spontaneous emission. Some of these atoms are going to randomly go back to ground state and release photons, right? And then that's the start of stimulated emission. Some of these photons, as they're traveling, they interact with more atoms and cause them to also go back to ground state and emit more coherent photons. And again, so, so it's, it's like a multiplicative effect. Uh, and as more and more photons get stimulated, well, some of them escape the cavity because you have a partial mirror here, but some others reflect back and, you know, just keep traveling back and forth between, between the two mirrors. Uh, so that's how you get the buildup of your stimulated emission. And that's why it's important to have a cavity because otherwise, why put mirrors there? You need the mirrors to contain some of these coherent photons inside the cavity so they keep stimulating uh, uh, more light. Uh, and then after, after the full buildup, you basically get full coherence and basically all the waves are, are lined up in phase frequency and polarization. Your cavity keeps lasing. You keep, all, all the time, you keep pumping it. It's not shown, but you can't stop. As soon as you stop the pump, because there's some laser escaping from the cavity, it just dies off. So you need to keep pumping the laser. Uh, for it to, to keep running. Uh, but, but that's a process, basically. So some of these stimulated emission photons keep traveling back and forth. Some of them escape the cavity. And that's basically the laser beam for you. Now, one thing to note is that, so if you have, a, so these are waves, right? Photons are waves. So if you have a wave that is traveling back and forth between two mirrors, um, for it to not interfere and cancel out itself, it needs to add in phase. And uh, what I mean by that, to just make it more clear, is if, if you look at the picture here, before looking at the math, uh, so, so here is like a two-dimensional picture of the cavity. So these are the two mirrors. So that's mirror one, mirror two. And let's say the cavity has some length L. Now, if you have a, a, a wave that is traveling back and forth between two mirrors, uh, for it to not cancel out itself, the wavelength of that, uh, of, of that wave, or the half wavelength should be, uh, or the cavity length should be an integer multiple of a half wavelength. Uh, so the, the, the longest wavelength you can have such that it adds in phase is half a wavelength equals L, so you get the two nulls basically on the two mirrors, and this thing keeps basically like a standing wave oscillating there. The second one, k equals 2, these are called the modes or the longitudinal modes of the cavity, is where your uh, wavelength equals L, or you get two lambda over twos uh, across the cavity. Then again, the, the nulls are aligned, and then this, this thing can uh, just oscillate without interfering with itself destructively. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. So the condition is the length of the cavity should be some integer multiple of a half wavelength. Um, and here I'm, I'm writing effective wavelength. I'll, I'll, I'll clarify what I mean by effective. But before that, look at the, all the ones down below. So if this condition is not met, um, this, is, this one is one example in, 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 in green is shown here. As this wave you know, travels back and forth between the two mirrors, it does not add in phase with itself. So it, eventually, it just decays and cancels out because all these random phases that, that at each point get added up, they just average to 0. So a mode that does not uh, meet this uh, resonance condition cannot laze, essentially. Uh, it, it just becomes a non-resonant or a decaying mode. Okay? So this condition is a very geometric condition, and it limits what laser wavelengths you can get out of a cavity of a given length L. Okay? Only, only wavelengths that, that basically satisfy the cavity condition can laze. Otherwise, it just cancels out. So that's one. And now, uh, what, what, what is lambda effective? So remember, inside the cavity, it's not air. It's some gain medium in there. right? And that changes the, the, the uh, wavelength of the light. As you know, uh, the, the, the wavelength is affected by the refractive index of the material. Uh, so if lambda is your uh, free space wavelength, uh, 
then inside the cavity, the wavelength is going to be, the effective wavelength is going to be the free space wavelength divided by n, where n is the refractive index of the medium. So for instance, if your gain, gain medium is made of silicon, uh, you can go check what the refractive index of silicon is, but it's about 3.9. So it basically reduces your, your wavelength inside the cavity by a factor of 2.9. The light that escapes the cavity, that is going to be at the free space wavelength because um, it's, it's going to just travel in free space. Um, we, you can also calculate the uh, frequencies of these different modes that uh, satisfy the cavity condition, call that F sub K. So as you know, frequency is just speed of light divided by the wavelength. Uh, and in terms of the cavity length L, you can write that as K times C divided by 2 NL, where we have just plugged in this, this expression for L into here, um, and, and that's the mode frequency. So again, the point is, uh, for a given cavity of a given geometry or length L, only very specific wavelengths can, lasing can happen at very specific wavelengths. It can't happen at every wavelength. And those wavelengths, in, or the, the frequencies corresponding to those wavelengths, they have a, a very you know, constant spacing. So the delta F, which is the delta frequency between two consecutive modes, uh, is just equal to speed of light times 2 times the refractive index times L. So that's kind of like the separation of these modes that, that can lace. So then the question is, OK, so if we have these different modes, longitudinal modes that can laze, as you turn on your laser, what wavelength do you actually get out of it? Or what frequency get out of it? Like which of these FKs, at the, are, are we going to get all of them? If we get all of them, it's not useful. Again, the point of a laser is have coherent monochromatic light. If you're getting like thousands of different frequencies out, that's not monochromatic. It's, it's the sweet frequencies, but there's too many of them. Now, practically, it turns out that not all of these can happen uh, or can, can laze. Why? Uh, the reason is, well, if you look at uh, the cavity, um, it's the, the material in there, it's, it's, a, it's a gain material. But the gain of the medium is also frequency dependent. And the reason it's, it's frequency dependent, it basically, uh, let's go back a few slides. It's because of what, what we have here, if I clean up this slide, remember that there is a energy band gap for every gain material. And that's a property of you know, the physics of the material. But this delta E means that um, when you pump the cavity, for instance, the closer your pump energy is to this delta E, you're going to get more gain out of it, because that means it's easier for these electrons to absorb that energy and go into the, 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 the balance band. Again, it's a fact from the quantum mechanics. You have to, you know, energies are, uh, energy levels are discretized. So to take the uh, atoms or electrons to an excited ex state, you have to feed them or pump them with an energy that is almost exactly equal to that you know, energy gap. So that means the closest your pump energy is to delta E, you you're going to be more efficient in terms of uh, this, this gain process. And as you go away from it, you just get less and less and less gain. And eventually, it wouldn't even absorb if your pump energy is too far off from delta E. That just the process is, isn't, isn't going to work. OK, so here's a picture to kind of illustrate that. So that means this, this, this blue curve here is like the optical gain of the medium as a function of frequency. It's going to peak around some frequency which is, again, according to that, like delta E equals H um, F, uh, it, it, it's going to be most efficient at, at, at some frequency that matches the delta E of the gain medium. Uh, the band, this is the band gap energy of the gain medium. OK. And then, so that's, that's the gain behavior. So it's, you get most gain at some frequency, and it kind of drops. But also, as, as for any other physical process, you also have some losses. So it's not perfect. What are the losses? I mean, some of the light just escapes out. Some of it, it's not, you know, uh, spontaneous. It's not stimulated, becomes a spontaneous emission. There's other factors that cause losses. So, so you also have some cavity loss level, OK? And for a mode to laze, in addition to satisfying the cavity condition, that geometric condition that L is k times lambda over 2, also, for those frequencies, 
the gain should be higher than the loss. Because if losses are higher, just, it just eventually decays and dies off. So by just comparing the gain and the loss, you see only for frequencies where gain is bigger than or equal to loss, those have a chance of lazing. So that would really limit, usually, to just a few modes that can laze. And those are called lazing modes. Here, they're highlighted in green. And again, why are these discretized modes? Because, because of the cavity condition. And if this is delta f, basically, that frequency delta between individual modes that can laze. OK. So then what you can do in practice when you design a laser, you can engineer this gain curve and the losses such that this, this g bigger than or equal to l is only satisfied for one mode. Uh, and what I mean by that is just you, know, you lower your gain or you increase your losses such that only for one mode you get g bigger than or equal to l, and then you make a single longitudinal mode laser. And those are the type of, types of lasers that we want for LIDARs, for instance. For other applications, you might want multi-mode lasers. So there, there are actually, so for in, in telecommunications, sometimes you want, uh, you want lasers which, which have multiple lasing modes. In sensing, specifically in LIDAR, it's very desirable to just have work with a single frequency. Uh, and, and that means we can only, you know, when it comes to sensing, look at that frequency and filter out everything else and really minimize you know, interferences and, and, and other things. And this is, again, exactly what you see when you look at the output spectrum of one of these lasers that are uh, used, used in LiDAR. You just see a very sharp peak at just one frequency, and everywhere else is just almost nothing. Um, and that's a single longitudinal mode laser. OK, any questions? All right, um, let's continue. So in, in practice, uh, again, there's, there's lots of different ways you can build lasers. Like when it comes to the gain medium, you can have gases, you can have you know, solid state things, semiconductors, and other things. Uh, the ones that are commonly used in, in, in LIDAR are semiconductor laser diodes, or SLDs. And specifically, there's two types of them. One is called edge emitting laser, or EEL. And the other type is called vertical cavity surface emitting laser, or VIXELs. And in principle, these are, I mean, both semiconductor lasers, so that gain medium is a, is a semiconductor, and everything is fabricated uh, in, 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 in one chip. Uh, but there's two different architectures um, for them, basically. And here, if you look at the pictures, I think that the difference is, is, is clear. Let's look at VIXEL first. So that's the one on the left. Um, and, and as you see, as the name suggests, the cavity is, is, is constructed vertically. So going from top to bottom, at the very bottom, you have one metal contact. And both these lasers are electrically pumped. So that's why they have metal contacts, so you can pass current through it and, and, and pump energy. And then you have some substrate. Typically, this is like silicon dioxide or something like that. Then this kind of like zebra stripe-like thing with multiple layers, that's how a mirror is built in semiconductors. So you stack two different dielectrics um, in multiple layer, layers. And by controlling the dielectric constant of the two materials and the thicknesses, you can build an almost perfect mirror at a given wavelength. Or you can build a partial mirror. So that's how mirrors are built. Um, very you know, uh, effective mirrors are built in, in semiconductor. Then you have your gain medium. That's, that's this uh, red part here. That's a gain medium. And then on top of the gain medium, uh, you have the partial mirror. Again, it's, it's used by a stack of two dielectrics. And then this yellow part up top, that's your second electrode. So again, the pump current is going through the, the, the gain medium and from the top electrode to the bottom. And then you need an opening. That's the aperture where the, the laser beam basically comes, comes out uh, of, the, of the device. So that's a VIXEL. And then the edge emitting laser, that's the one on the right, uh, it's a simpler construction. You still have your two electrodes, one at the top, one at the bottom, so you can electrically pump it. Uh, but the, the cavity here is, 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 is vertical. So on one side, that's the partial reflective uh, mirror. That's, that's where the laser beam comes out. At the back, you have the fully reflective mirror. And the way the mirrors are constructed for EEL is just by cleaving the facets of the, of the device. And there's these cleaving techniques that can give you different, basically, reflective Reflectivities, also you can code them to, to control, to control the, the, the reflectivity. 
Um, so Vixel is a far superior technology for a couple of reasons. One is, as it's shown here in the pictures, the, uh, the beams that you get out of Vixels, they're more symmetric. So they have like a cir nice circular cross section. Uh, versus in uh, edge emitting lasers, you get these like elliptical cross sections, and that is that's asymmetry is not desired because this beam essentially is going to determine the shape of the pixels in your lidar point cloud, for instance, and you want them to be you know nice and circular, not asymmetric. That's not a desirable property. Um, but also, uh, uh, Vixels have, for instance, better temperature stability and and and, and things like that. So they're a superior technology, um, but also they're more expensive. Um, so uh, they're rapidly, again, becoming cheaper and, 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 and more used in, in, in LIDARs. Uh, but today, both are used. Both edge emitting and, and VIXELs are used. But I think eventually, uh, VIXELs are going are gonna to dominate the, the market. And then the, specifically, the gain material that is used for these semiconductor laser diodes is indium gallium arsenide phosphide, which is this uh, very specific you know, mix of, uh, of, of, of four materials that, that makes a very good gain medium at these IR frequencies or IR wavelengths. Uh, questions? OK, so one last thing about lasers is about the output characteristic of these uh, semiconductor uh, laser diodes. As I said, uh, you pump them electrically. So you pass some electrical current through it, and then it, it, it outputs a laser for you. But it turns out that there is a minimum current that you need. There's a current threshold that, that you need to use for your pump for it to laze. If you pump it with less than that threshold current, it actually acts like an LED. But as soon as your current goes above the threshold, then lasing happens. And it's, it's very clear. If you have one of these devices and slowly crank up the current that passes through it, it's very clear. At first, it's like not very efficient. You get like broad beams out of it, like an LED. And as soon as you go above the threshold, the beam, you know, becomes nice and sharp and coherent and single wavelength. Uh, so when lasing happens, you get much higher efficiency than the LED regime. Uh, you get smaller angular spread. Your beam becomes more focused, and uh, you also of course, in the spectrum, you become, uh, because of that uh, coherence uh, effect, you become uh, pretty narrow uh, about the, the, the longitudinal mode of the, of the cavity. Um, here's the electrical behavior. So if you plot basically the, the pump current, say in milliamps, uh, or the ap ap output optical power versus the pump current, uh, it's very clear if you just look at the curve. Uh, when you're under the threshold, you know, it's less efficient, lower power, that's the LED regime. And as soon as you go above it, the curve becomes much sharper, you, it becomes a laser, you can, it's more efficient, you get more power out of it, and you get all the properties of the, of the lasers. One thing to note is that this uh, threshold current can change with temperature. Um, and that's one of the things where VIXELs are better than EELs, is that there's less variation in that threshold current for, for VIXELs. Um, and, and, and that, again, is a, is a good property for that. OK, so that's about lasers. Again, we didn't go super deep um, because it really requires uh, a, a lot of you know, quantum mechanics related discussions. But you know, it, it, it's, I think it's useful to at least know at a high level how lasing works, what is a laser, what types of laser devices are used for, for LIDARs. Now the second topic is, OK, so now we have a source, a laser. How do you actually illuminate the scene with this laser, right? You want to shine it through the scene, and, and, and how do you do that? Um, there are two main techniques when it comes for LIDARs to use these laser sources to illuminate the scene. Uh, first is called flash LIDAR. So flash LIDAR, basically, it's kind of like flash photography. So it diffuses the laser into a very broad beam, exactly like a, like a flash that a camera uses. And it, in one shot, illuminates the entire scene with a very wide laser beam, and then receives the echoes from the entire scene, uh, again, in one shot, and uses an array of photo detectors, exactly like a camera, uh, to estimate the time of flight per pixel. So a flash lighter essentially works like a regular camera with a flash, except the pixels in the, in the detector 
give you time of flight instead of RGB color. That's, that's the main, main difference. Um, and then you have scanning LiDAR. And scanning LiDAR, basically, the way it illuminates this, this scene, it uses very narrow laser beams, like the type of beam you get out of a laser pointer, for instance, and then scans the beam, like does a raster scan of like moving it around, so it illuminates the scene one point at a time instead of the entire scene altogether, and uh, measures time of flight per point. So I'm pointing to that direction, measure time of flight, move it, measure my time of flight, move it, measure time of flight. So it does this scanning thing for you. And uh, because it's illuminating just one point at a time, it can just use a single pixel photo detector. Just, just one photo detector is enough for it to work. It doesn't need an array. Uh, here's two pictures uh, uh, showing the two cases. So left is the flash LiDAR. Um, and then uh, what it typically has is it can work with one laser in principle, but usually they use a laser array. And then in front of the laser array, they also put some optical diffusers. And that's how they get this you know, very wide laser uh, beam pattern that can illuminate a very large area in the scene. And then all of it reflects, uh, echoes back or reflects back, goes through the receiver lenses and shines on an array of uh, photo detectors. So again, each, it's exactly like a camera. Each pixel here, essentially, if you trace the ray back, it's coming from some small area in the scene. Uh, and but each pixel, the difference between a flash lidar and a camera is instead of color, it gives you a a, a tau eye or tau hat eye, which is the time of flight for that part of the scene. So it gives you then, if you convert the time of flights to ranges, it gives you a depth map instead of like a color image. Um, so that's how the flash lighter works. And then, and then on the, if I can zoom in, on the right, you have your scanning lighter, which uh, uses one single uh, laser diode. And it has some scanning mechanism, a beam scanner. We'll talk more about it. Here, it's like a rotating uh, polygon mirror that you're showing. So uh, that's how beam is being scanned. And uh, basically, it, 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 it has some raster pattern. Here, it's going in rows. So it's scanning you know, one row, and then another row, and then another row. Uh, but each row, is, you can think of it as you know, a bunch of you know, little, little points where you measure the time of flight to. And at each point, depending on where it's pointing, uh, again, light reflects back, goes through the op, um, uh, receiver optics. And then you just use a single photo detector, just one pixel. And that pixel gives you a time of flight, tau hat, which determines the depth to that one point in the scene. And then you go to the next, and then you go to the next. So um, scanning LiDAR kind of builds your 3D map sequentially, versus flash LiDAR is just one shot. Uh, gives you everything. So uh, which is better? Um, again, there's, there's no better. There's, there's trade-offs. And the big trade-off here is I think here photography is a perfect example. Uh, well, flash prop photography, if, if you want to um, take a picture of a very dark scene, um, flash is very useful as long as you don't need to see very far, right? Like flash photography use, uh, works very well in indoor environments where you only need to like see a few meters um, because all of your energy, because it's being spread uh, across the entire scene, per unit area, you have a lot less optical power, right? Um, so so fla exact same thing applies to flash LiDAR. So again, flash photography works beautifully indoors, but if, you're taking a, if you want to take a picture of a landscape and you want to see hundreds of meters, you cannot use a flash. I mean, maybe I mean, it, it would be a flash that would blind everybody if you used it. Um, so if, if you want to be eye safe, you cannot use a flash to take a picture you know, out in the wild. Same thing for LiDAR. So, um, but actually, before we talk about that, here's one picture of what a flash LiDAR uh, uses as the laser source. So this is a Vixel array. So each of these little circles here is a vertical cavity surface emitting laser. Uh, if you zoom in, this is the exact structure we looked at. Actually, if you even zoom in even further, you see the zebra stripes here, which is, which is the mirror. And then it's, it's a pretty dense array. So all of this is just one silicon chip, basically, with many lasers on it. And then they put a diffuser 
and then with that they can they can get like a flash like very wide uh, laser laser beam. Um, in terms of the quality of the point clouds that you get out of a flash lidar versus a scanning lidar, here's a here's a comparison. So this is a camera image of the scene. It's outdoors, you know. There's buildings, cars, and 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 whatnot. And with a, with a flash lidar, this is what you get. Uh, and 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 as expected, it's very dense. You know, um, you can't. There's no no scanning. Basically, it's it's it's. Uh, you get very high resolution, lots of pixels, and all are essentially measured synchronously in one shot. Okay, so that's our flash LiDAR. But then if you do scan the, uh, or, or, or map the same scene with scanning LiDARs, uh, you see something like this. So here's a scanning LiDAR which used 16 scan lines, kind of like horizontally going 360 degrees. So that's why you get these rings. And it's a 3D map. Color means depth here, so it goes from like orange to green or something like that uh, according to range. So here, uh, the LiDAR was kind of like at the center here. And then it was like scanning like that, but it had multiple, multiple, you know, scan lines. So it did 16. And uh, you, of course, get a much, much coarser map compared to the flash LiDAR. Uh, you can increase your number of scan lines with this scanning LiDAR. So here we went from 16 to 32. It becomes denser, but still not nearly as dense as the flash LiDAR, okay? So from this, you might conclude that, okay, so flash is better, right? Like this is a much higher resolution, much denser uh, kind of a point cloud, which is true. But again, it only works at short ranges. Uh, so that's the, one of the, the main trade-offs. So when it comes to scanning versus flash LiDAR, uh, the, the trade-off is with flash LiDAR, uh, you, you get a resolution that is determined by the photo detector array pixel size exactly like a camera, right? How many photo detector pixels you have inside your array and how big they are determines the resolution. It's like a camera. Uh, you can have much higher frame rates. Why? Because in one shot you're measuring the entire scene. So you can do it many, many times per second. So up to like hundreds of frames per second is, is possible. But the big, big drawback is you get short range. So you can barely get 10, 15, 20, maybe close to 50 meters, but really not beyond that with flash LiDAR. Why? Because remember, the amount of energy you can emit is capped by the eye, safe, eye safety limits. And with flash LiDAR, you are spreading that energy budget that you have across the entire scene in one shot, so you just can penetrate less depth. Uh, your energy is much more spread, exactly like flash photography. For the same reason flash photography doesn't work at long ranges, flash LiDAR also doesn't work at long ranges. What about scanning LiDAR? Well, it's the same trade-offs. Basically, uh, resolution is uh, here determ determined by the spot size of the beam that you're using to scan the scene and also how fast you're moving it. That kind of determines your spot, effective spot size, which is your resolution in the point cloud. You can see much longer range. Again, why? Because that energy budget that you have, you're using all of it collimated in one beam, so that can go much, much further out. You can see hundreds of meters. Four, five hundred is, 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 is reasonably easily doable uh, with, with that, uh, with the scanning LiDAR. But it's going to be slower, again, because you're now sequentially measuring one point at a time. And, to, to scan the full scene, it just takes longer than flash LiDAR. So frame rates are typically less than 30 frames per second. 10, 10 FPS is typical what you get from like a commercial LiDAR today. Usually that's, that's what to expect, 10 FPS. So who's better? I mean, depends, right? If, if your application is, does not require to see very long range, and, uh, but for instance, it requires very high frame rates, you should go with a flash LiDAR. If your application requires to see very long range, but you can give up uh, frame rate, then you should go with a scanning LiDAR. Most of the LiDARs on the market today are, are scanning LiDARs, and the reason is the LiDAR market has been very driven by um, the, the, basically the efforts along the lines of self-driving cars or autonomous vehicles, which require long range, which means uh, basically, scanning LiDAR is, a, is, a, is the right architecture for them. But, I mean, flash LiDAR in certain applications, it can work much, much better. Um, again, like if you're operating in a mine or 
I don't know, inside forests, and you don't need to see that far, but you need better resolution, higher frame rate, flash LiDAR could be the, the choice. Uh, any questions? Yes. The two flash LiDAR and type of flight camera. It, it's, it's essentially the same. It's, yeah, I, I think it, it, that's, that's just a different way of um, calling it. And time of flight camera is a camera where per pixel it gives you essentially time of flight flash light or is the same. Yeah, uh, yeah. They might work at different wavelengths, but flash light or works at, at, at IR. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, next topic is, uh, so when it comes to the scanning LiDAR, uh, which is a uh, more common type of LiDAR to use for, for autonomy, uh, we need to talk about the type of, you know, this, this collimated beams that come out of the, the, the lasers. We need to talk about the physics of those and what happens to them as they propagate. Uh, so that's the topic of, of, of Gaussian beams that, that we're going to talk about uh, next. Now, when it comes to laser beams, um, the way at least I used to think about them before I, I learned about Gaussian beams was that if you have a laser diode, uh, you get this, you know, so let's say this is your semiconductor laser diode, and there's this, this beam of light, beam of laser coming out of it, and it's just like perfectly collimated. There's just like this pencil beam coming out, essentially going forever. I mean, it will get attenuated, but it stays perfectly collimated. Uh, well, it turns out that that, that is wrong. It's not how collimated beams work. Every physically realizable beam, uh, it's going to have regions where it, uh, it basically is converging and regions of, of propagation when it's diverging. Um, so if you take a beam that is in this slide going from left to right and call that z direction, that's the direction of propagation, every physically realizable beam, it's going to you know, have some region where it's converging, and then it reaches some focus plane where that's the kind of like the minimum waist size of the beam, and then after that, it, it is going to start diverging, okay? And that's, that, this, is, this is a fact that any beam that you can physically make, it's going to have this property. Um, for instance, we have talked about plane waves before, and plane waves don't do that, but we also know plane waves are not physically realizable beams. Those are kind of like a mathematical idealization that helps us you know, analyze certain cases. And what determines, like, is, is the beam going to converge or diverge, or is it at the focus? focus it's actually, the, if you look at the wave fronts, and wave fronts, remember, they're surfaces of constant phase of the electric field. So if you look at the, these constant phase planes, which are called the phase front or the wave front. If the wave fronts are concave, that means the, the beam is going to converge. And then when it comes to focus, uh, you get a flat phase front. And then after that, you're going to get convex phase fronts, and that means your beam is, is diverging. Why is that? Because always, you know, locally, the direction of the wave travel is perpendicular to the phase front or wave front, so that means if it's concave, the beam is going to converge, and if it's convex, it's going to diverge. And that's how every, every beam works. So we need to build a physical model or a mathematical model to be able to talk about these focused beams, and then that would enable us to talk about basically beams used for LIDARs. Um, there is extremely useful uh, approximation to how waves travel, uh, which is called the paraxial wave, uh, uh, the paraxial wave approximation. And this really, really simplifies the math when we want to talk about focused beams. So what the par paraxial wave approximation says is that, again, if you, have a, if you have a wave that is, say, traveling in some direction, and call that the z direction, OK? The z axis is the axis of propagation. Uh, it, it says that if. If you look far enough down the, the axis of propagation of the wave, any kind of wave, you can approximate the electric field uh, as some envelope, call that u, which is a function of x, y, z, the coordinates, times a plane wave that is traveling in the z direction, which, are, which we're writing as e to the minus j, norm k, z. Okay. Let's look at this plane wave first. If you remember, we have looked at plane waves a, a few times, but plane waves are always given by e to the minus j, the wave vector times 
r, which is the position vector, the dot product. So why are we writing it as, as this? Well, the reason is, again, we are assuming the wave is traveling in the z direction. So the wave vector is just norm k z hat. And, and r is x, x hat plus y, y hat plus z, z hat. So if you take the inner product of this k and that r, that just gives you norm k z. So that actually is a plane wave traveling in the z direction. And then you have this, this, this envelope, which the envelope just determines the, you know, how the amplitude or the intensity of that uh, wave or, 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 or light beam changes at different places in, in space. Um, Specifically, in the, in the paraxial limit, as I said, it's the limit where you're you know, far along in the z-axis, the direction of the, 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 the propagation of the light. So the, the paraxial assumption uh, assumes that the z is much larger than x and y. So we are just you know, looking along the direction of, of, of the travel, far along uh, the, the travel direction, um, you know, just, just, just around the main axis of, of the travel of the light. So z is much bigger than x and y, which means you can approximate norm of r at any point uh, that, that is along the direction of the travel, uh, which is square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Because z is much larger than x and y, you can approximate it by this expression. And this is nothing special. It's just the, the first order Taylor series expansion to square root of like one plus v or one plus x, which becomes one plus v over two. So with that, norm of r, we can write it in terms of x, y, z as z plus x squared plus y squared over two z. So let's apply this, this paraxial limit, say, to a, uh, a spherical wave. I, I just want to show you that the, the paraxial wave approximation always works and, and, and is a useful thing. So a, a spherical wave, in general, as you know, it's given by this expression. This we have seen multiple times, like e to the minus j norm k norm r divided by norm of r. That is the definition of the spherical wave. But now, a spherical wave in the paraxial limit, if, if you apply the thing that we just derived, you can write it or approximate it with this, which is 1 over z times e to the minus j norm k times x squared plus y squared over 2z uh, times e to the minus j norm kz. Yeah. All I did here, I just plugged in, if I go one slide back, I just plugged in this expression for norm r into my spherical wave, uh, basically, equation. And uh, if I clean this up, if you inspect this closely, it's exactly what we say the, the paraxial wave approximation is. Call this part your u of x and y and z, and this is your plane wave. So this is just, you know, I mean, we didn't do it for a, 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 a general wave. But you know, for, for spherical waves, it's, it's very easy to show, for instance, that this thing, this thing holds. Uh, but it's a true fact, again, for any, any type of wave, you can apply this paraxial wave approximation if you're far along the axis of, of the propagation. And again, your u is, is given by, by this expression here. Now, this was for spherical waves. We can, uh, we can make this more general. And the generalization you can do is replace the z here uh, by a complex factor, z plus j times b. Okay? Um, and, and, and we'll see what this b is. But here it's just a generalization. So we're substituting z with a complex parameter called z plus b. Uh, then the envelope, for instance, becomes everywhere we had z, we just substitute z plus jb. So you get z plus jb here and z plus jb here. Okay? Now, this is interesting. This is what essentially uh, constitutes a, a Gaussian beam. Uh, because if, if you look at this, this u here, and again, we talked about uh, focused beams. This is going to go through you know, converging and diverging regions and a, and a focus point. Uh, but if you, for, for any fixed z, if you look at this u, so if you look at u of x and y and any z0, fix your z. So look at the plane that is perpendicular to the axis of the, the propagation of the wave. You just you know, put like a piece of paper and, and look at the, the, the envelope of that field. Uh, you would see that, what kind of a function is this for, for a fixed z? It's a Gaussian, right? Like this thing becomes a Gaussian function for any fixed z. Specifically, to make it even more obvious, let's look at the z equals 0 plane. 
So you just plug in z equals zero in here and look at that envelope part of our, of our approximated wave. Plug in z equals zero, your envelope becomes this, one over jb times e to the minus x squared plus y squared divided by, we have defined this omega zero, but that's just equal to this, square root of lambda b over pi, just to make the math a little more simpler. This is a Gaussian function, right? I mean, that's, that's exactly a Gaussian function. Uh, so that's why um, in the paraxial limit, uh, you can approximate uh, a, a, a propagating beam as a Gaussian beam. Again, what is it? It's like a plane wave that is traveling in the, in the, in the z direction. Uh, but if you look at the cross section of the beam, either in the field amplitude or the intensity, it has a two-dimensional Gaussian profile. And this should be pretty familiar to you. If you have ever looked at, like, shine the laser pointer on a piece of paper on a wall, that pattern that you see, that is a 2D Gaussian. It's bright in the center and kind of tapers off as you, as you go away. Uh, that's exactly what this function basically uh, describes. So let's look at this picture again. Um, same thing. So that's, a, that's our beam, that's, that's our Gaussian beam that's, that's propagating. And it turns out that at z equals z equal zero is actually the focus plane of, of the beam. Like if you, if you check the, 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 the beam waste as a function of z it, it, and you minimize it, it happens to be at z equals zero. So that's, and again, if this was like a laser pointer, laser kind of like pointing in, in, in some direction and you put like a piece of paper, uh, this, is, this is the kind of pattern you see, like that red, you know, uh, 2D Gaussian pattern. That's, that's what you see. Um, there's two important parameters about it. Uh, one is, as it propagates again, it's, it's going to, after its focus point, it's going to diverge, okay? Now, how fast, and, and the divergence, it's, it's described by uh, this parameter W of Z, which is, which is the beam radius. What is W? So at, at every Z point, if you look at the distance from the axis of propagation uh, over which the intensity of the light drops by 1 over E, that distance is called W of Z. That's called kind of like the, the, the radius of, of, of your beam. Uh, and it increases as the beam travels according to this expression. I didn't go through the derivation of this. It's in the notes. But I thought that's, that's uh, a bit too detailed for for the, for the lecture. Um, but that's your beam radius. And what's important about this is, again, it's, it's going to increase as beyond the, 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 the beam waves, it's going to increase. And, uh, so the, and that's determined by, by this z. But uh, one parameter you can define is this angle of uh, divergence, which, which I'm calling theta d here. So that angle kind of also de determines like how quickly your beam is, is uh, uh, diverging. And it turns out that this angle is almost equal to lambda over pi omega zero. And what is omega zero? Omega zero is your, like your minimum waste. Like at the focus point, what is the waste radius of your uh, beam? And then your angle of divergence is inversely proportional to it. So the very important point here is that the sharper or the smaller or the tighter you focus your beam, the quicker it's going to diverge. Um, and, and that's uh, going to be uh, an issue when it comes to, 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 to LIDARs. Um, so I just want to quickly illustrate this. Here I have, a, I have a red laser that is coupled to a fiber. Uh, so if I turn this on, so you see it, it became red. So, so fiber is just, you know, just a glass waveguide, and the, f for the entire length of this yellow fiber, the laser is entirely contained in the fiber, so that limits its beam waste to the diameter of the core of the fiber, which is just uh, 10 microns, okay? So at the tip of the fiber, uh, you can think of this point here, if I clean up my, my slide, uh, this is going to, this plane is the tip of my fiber. Right? That's the kind of like the focus point of the, of the beam. And after that, it's going to diverge. And it's a very tight focus, right? It's just 10 microns. So if I put a um, paper very close to this, you see it's, it's, it's a very tight beam. I don't know if, it, if you see it well or not. But see how quickly it diverges as I go away. See? It just blows up. 
very, very, very quickly. Like I'm, I'm a few inches away and it's already you know, blown up. First you kind of see the tip of my fiber is a little dirty, so that's why it's not a, like a perfect Gaussian, but it's kind of a Gaussian, right? It's a 2D Gaussian and it's very quickly diverging. And that's a problem, right? I can't use this for a LiDAR because if I'm a meter away, look how big that spot is. I can't work with that if I want to see hundreds of meters, right? And that is why we need optics, we need lenses that basically take this beam that is diverging very quickly. This could be, this is a fiber, but you can think of it as a laser diode, same thing. These are small devices, they make very tightly focused beams that come out of them, but they diverge very, very quickly. So that's why you need lenses to, to collimate them. I'm just gonna take, I know we're almost over time, but because I brought toys, I'm just gonna take one more minute and complete this experiment. What I have here is, is just a lens. I mean, it's a, it's a metal housing, but there's a lens in it. Uh, and that lens is designed to um, basically collimate the beam that's coming out of this fiber. So if I hook up my fiber to this without breaking anything, because these things are a little tricky. Okay, so now we have a lens in front of it. And now let's see what happens. What the lens does is it transforms the beam waist diameter to a much larger, so from 10 microns, it brings it to about seven millimeters. So you, have a, you get a bigger beam, right? It's like even very close, it's like a few millimeters, seven millimeters diameter, but see, it doesn't, it doesn't diverge. Now it's, now it's more or less, actually it goes through a focus point, that's its focus point, and then after that it, it Actually, the focus point is a little further away, but it doesn't diverge as quickly. Now this beam, I can, I can now see on the wall, it's now uh, a few millimeters or maybe a, an inch, but from the bare fiber, it would have been meters in size across. I mean, if I, if I remove the, the lens, we wouldn't even see it on the wall because it's diverged so much that nothing is getting back to our eyes, basically. Uh, this lens wasn't quite designed for LED la red laser. It's designed for IR, but I'm using it on red laser. That's why it doesn't perfectly collimate the beam. Uh, but you get the point that why we need optics, and by optics I mean lenses, is because to control the divergence angle of the beam, you need lenses, and then you can design those according to your application requirements. If you need your beam to be a certain diameter at 500 meters, you find the right lens and then use that in your optics. We'll talk more about it uh, next time, and sorry we went over time, uh, but I just wanted to show you this quick experiment.